Okay, here we go. All right. Well, that, <clears throat> that's a picture of me there from the University of Iowa. I've been there for about 12 years now, focusing mainly on adult inflammatory bowel disease patients. These are my disclosures that I have to let you know about my involvement in research and grant funding. And I am a professor of pediatrics at Riley Hospital for Children at the Indiana University School of Medicine. I have no disclosures, as I said. These are the program disclosures. So we wanted to start just by talking about the immune system, right? We know that inflammatory bowel disease is an autoimmune disease. And in young children, the immune system is developing. So when we're in utero, we have maternal exposures. Uh, antibodies pass across the placenta into the newborn. But once that cord is cut, we have these maternal antibodies that eventually go away after a few months. But then this immune system has to develop in a young child. And it really doesn't develop sort of adult competency until we're adolescents, right? So all those exposures we have uh, as young children and adolescents help our immune system develop. And if there's alterations in our immune system, that puts us at risk for diseases, including things like inflammatory bowel disease. And this is also why it's important for us to vaccinate young children, because that developing immune system needs those vaccines to protect us from all these communicable diseases. And then once our immune system is trained, in adulthood, our immune system is constantly handling the barrage of uh, environmental insults from infections and uh, what we eat, exposures, antigens, allergens. And as we get older, our immune system actually changes again. So through a variety of biological processes that I don't want to get into here, our immune system changes where it doesn't respond as well anymore as it did in adulthood, and it's no longer being trained. And it even develops a low level of inflammation very mild throughout the body. And so what that does is it puts us at risk as we get older to get infections, to be susceptible to cancers, even develop more autoimmune uh, reactions in our body, autoimmune antibodies, puts us at risk for autoimmune diseases later in life too. And in regards to vaccinations, as we get older, we don't respond to these vaccinations as well. So we have to come up with different strategies for the elderly population of how we vaccinate them. So when we think of this immune system in the spectrum of age then in inflammatory bowel disease, we do have children that are diagnosed at a very young age. And so less than five or six years of age, we term that very early onset IBD or DEO IBD, if you've heard that term before. And if you look at that little graph, those children have a large uh, genetic component, probably a bigger genetic component to their disease than, than children who are diagnosed at a later age or adult uh, diagnoses. And so in those early um, onset IBD patients, we're doing a more extensive immunologic and genetic workup in those patients. And as we get older, the, the theory is, is that we uh, move away from the development of the disease from a genetic perspective or genetic initiation towards environmental insults that create inflammation in our body and in our intestinal tract. So during adulthood, you may experience symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease, and they may not get diagnosed or come to a diagnosis until later. But there are specific populations of patients that develop symptoms after the age of 60. So this late onset of inflammatory bowel disease occurs in 10 to 15 percent of new diagnoses. So a substantial portion of our population of patients with IBD develop IBD later in life. And the thought is, is that environmental triggers have led to this as opposed to genetic triggers. If we look at the disease behavior, then there's also a difference between those that are diagnosed at a younger age versus those that are diagnosed at an older age. So we can look at this in two ways. First of all, we can look at diagnosis. So if you looked at the left-hand graph, which is the pediatric onset Crohn's disease, you can see about 73% have what we term inflammatory disease. That's diarrhea, pain, weight loss, those sorts of things. But a certain percentage, about 23%, present with stricturing disease. That's narrowing disease. And even a small percentage have what we call penetrating disease. They might develop fistulas. Getting diagnosed at a young age, though, is a risk factor for more complicated Crohn's disease. And you can see if we look over time then, over 20 years on this graph, 
we have a larger number of patients who are in that orange or yellow part of the graph that are developing stricturing type disease or, fish, or fit penetrating or fistulizing type disease. And that means they might need more aggressive therapies either early on or later on. They might need uh, bigger medicines and they might need uh, surgical therapies as well as their disease progresses. And obviously a big part of our research and focus is now trying to prevent this from happening in early pediatric onset Crohn's disease. And you can see how this graph changes. If you look at the graph on your right side on the screen, where the pink color is the inflammatory part, that tends to be stable when you're diagnosed later in life. So there's less reports of development of complications of inflammatory bowel disease, namely in this graph in Crohn's disease, where you develop the complications of strictures and fistulas. It tends to be more steady throughout time. But something that's very interesting in the population of patients diagnosed after the age of 60 is that the rates of surgery are similar to that in adulthood. And we'll get into that, I'll get into that a little bit of why that may happen. But even if we're developing less complications over time, as that graph shows, the rates of surgery are the same. And the way the disease presents or is diagnosed later in life is a little bit different too. So if you're diagnosed after the age of 60, you're more likely to have Crohn's disease that involves just the colon. Or if you're uh, diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, you're more likely to have ulcerative colitis that involves the end or lower half of your colon called left side of your colon. So slightly different than the younger presentation. And I think these graphs then reflect what we just talked about, right, is that if you look at some of our more powerful medications like biologics and immune modulators, the pediatric was the short dash line. You can see there is a higher percentage of patients who use these more powerful medications in over time. This is, uh, these are graphs that were published in 2018. I think these numbers are even higher now, you know, less than five years later. But, but clearly with pediatric onset disease, probably have more aggressive disease, we want to prevent complications of disease, and therefore we have a higher rate of using some of these stronger medications. And the, the other concept I take away from this graphic is if you see the solid line, it's, that represents the older population of 60 and older, and that's at the bottom of each one of these categories in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in biologics and immunomodulators. So a lower number of these medications are being used in this demographic of patients. So could it be that we're under-treating our patients who are 60 and older, maybe because we're fearful of the side effects of these medications? But it might be one of the reasons why these patients are ending up with having more surgeries uh, with less aggressive disease. The other thing that we wanted to mention about medications is that pharmacokinetics differ between children and adults and elderly patients. Pharmacokinetics refers to how fast our body metabolizes different medications. And this is a complicated graph. I don't want to you know, bore you with the details. What I want to show you is if you look at the uh, graph A, is that we can dose children in different ways based on their weight, based on their BSA or body surface area, or use something called tear dosing. And the higher that graph is, a uh, bar on that graph, that means the more drug exposure, which is good usually for these patients is. The other thing I wanted to tell you about this graph is, if you look at graph B, weight-based dosing, you can even see that children of different age ranges, here two to five, six to 11, 12 to 17, if we, if we dose based on their weight, their drug exposure is even different in those different age ranges. What that means is children of different ages metabolize drug at different rates, which is, you know, very fascinating. And that means that we need to be careful about how we dose drugs in children. Um, and we need more studies to find out the best way to dose these drugs in children. We, we don't think about this much in the adult population, other than we know that some of these medications are just stably dosed or dosed based off of your weight. But in the older patients, what we have to think about is drug-drug interactions. So not just the pharmacokinetics or the amount of drug that's in your bloodstream after you take it, but what if you're taking 5, 10, 15 other medications and you mix it with some of your inflammatory bowel disease medications, how does that affect the uh, level in your bloodstream? So th there's not much data on that in the uh, elderly population. That's a definite gap in our research. 
So what we'd like to do now is go through several different categories of the IBD medications, and I'm sure you're all familiar with many of these, and sort of, we're going to give you a sort of a stoplight approach to how we feel we should use these medications in these different populations. Uh, we're going to start with corticosteroids or steroids. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. These are very powerful, broad, sort of based anti-inflammatory medications, and they certainly help patients with IBD feel better, and they're best suited for short-term control uh, of symptoms. You're familiar with many of these uh, types of, of steroids, prednisone being very common. There's sort of the uh, limited absorption eudesonide preparations like Entacort or Eucerus, and there's also some rectal uh, preparations of steroids as well, suppositories, enemas, or foams that can be used. So when we look at this stoplight approach um, in children, we use steroids, but we like to certainly spare steroids as much as possible, and there are several reasons we do that. Um, steroids are not good for linear growth or bones, right? So if you take steroids for a long period of time, you stop growing taller. Their poor uh, bone, mineral, uh, bone mineralization is often seen with chronic steroid use. Um, children can get high blood pressure. Children get those famous side effects of steroids like mood swings, right? That's happy one minute, crying next minute, angry the next minute. The moon face and acne is, you know, no fun for any adolescent, as you might imagine, and no, no kid or teenager wants to take these steroids and get those sort of side effects. So, you know, we put this in the red zone. We'll use them for short-term symptom control, but really they're not a long-term strategy for pediatrics. Similarly, in the adult population, as we use these medications intermittently, we try to use them sparingly and use steroid-sparing medications that we're going to get into here shortly. But they cause similar problems in the older population as well, adults and elderly. They're, you're uh, more susceptible to underlying diseases. If you're on steroids frequently, you might get diabetes easier, congestive heart failure, exacerbations easier. You'll also have altered mental status, so mood swings to confusion you're older will develop on, on steroids. And if your bone is more susceptible to being weaker or thinner, osteoporosis, if you're on steroids, you're more likely to achieve that. The biggest concern we have in patients who are over the age of 60 and using steroids is that there's a significant increased risk of infections when you're on steroids for a prolonged period of time. They're almost three times greater risk of infection compared to the adult population or the younger population. Despite the fact that there's an increased risk of infection with steroids, Interestingly, studies have shown that we use steroids more frequently in the older patient population compared to the younger patient population. Again, that gets into maybe fears of using these medi other medications or steroid sparing medications because of side effects unnecessarily, I think, and putting this elderly population at risk. So the next category of medications are the 5-amino salicylates, sorry, the mesalamine categories. These are medications that have been along for a long time. They're, <clears throat> they promote their effect right at the level of the intestine. It's not deemed to be an immunosuppressant. They reduce inflammation at the gut level. They're oral medications, and there's a variety of different preparations. The ones you would choose depend on where you want the mesalamine or the 5-ASA to be released. Some of the 5-ASA can be released in the small intestine. Other can be released at different parts of the colon. It's broadly used because of its perceived safety. It doesn't have the potential risks of the biologic immunotherapies and steroids. But it is very effective in ulcerative colitis, not as effective in Crohn's disease. You've seen a lot, I won't go through all the list of, of the different uh, brand names of these medications. I'm sure you've seen them or are aware of them. But there's different formulations you can use from oral to even topical, meaning rectal suppositories or liquid formulations administered by enema. And how we position this is based on the disease process. So if you have ulcerative colitis, this is typically a first-line therapy because of its efficacy. And if it, you have Crohn's disease, it's less likely to be a first-line therapy. However, again, in the older population, if we're scared of using steroids or scared of using immunotherapies because we're just not aware of the potential risk of these, some patients will be treated with mesalamines uh, a little bit longer than they should be, and so their disease will remain active. So the things we need to think about are, even though it's safe, and the stoplight gives us a position of green here, 
the efficacy may not be ideal for patients with Crohn's, and it might be more ideal for patients with ulcerative colitis. What we have to think about in the elderly population is that there's a rare risk of kidney injury in the use of these medications, but it is rare. And then the other thing we have to think about is pill burden. So if you're already taking nine medications a day, and some of those are more than one pill, and you use a mesalamine preparation that may be two, three, up to nine pills a day, then you dramatically increase the pill burden for the patient who's already taking a lot of medications, and that's not necessarily a good thing either. We uh, think the five ASA medications are very safe for kids as well, and we use them frequently. Um, as you can see, though, the difficulties with kids are these are sometimes very big pills. You may have seen these before, and, and you sometimes have to take a lot of pills, as Steve has mentioned, and that can be hard for young children to do. And, and kids are often sensitive to using rectal administration as well, so we have to take that into account as well. But we've classified this in the green level of the stoplight. The, the next class of medicines we wanted to talk about are the immune modulators. These are sort of the step up from the 5-ASA medications. These medications work by modulating the activity of the immune system to try and tamper it down a bit so it's not as active. These are slower acting. They may take several weeks or months even to take effect. And so they're used as maintenance agents. They're really not used as what we call induction agents to get someone into remission. They're used once someone is in remission to sustain that remission. So, for instance, you might use steroids briefly to put someone in remission and then transition them to one of the immune modulators. And they can be used in conjunction with several of our biologic medications, which we'll talk about in a few minutes as well. There's several sort of different uh, medications we use in the immune modulator class. You may have heard of things like azathioprine or 6 mercaptocurine, which are related. There's a medicine called methotrexate, which has been around a very, very long time. And there are some other medications a little bit more powerful like cyclosporin or tacrolimus, which are often used in uh, organ transplant populations as well. These are a tricky class of medications to talk about safety and use um, for several reasons. Um, there is an increased risk of lymphoma uh, in these, uh, these, some of these medications, specifically the thiopurines, which is azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine. And there's a specific type of lymphoma called HSTCL, which we worry about because it appears to have a higher risk in, in males under 35 who are taking these medications who have been exposed to these medications. And so for males, we're sort of uh, getting away from the use of thiopurines over time. For females, not as much, um, but still, I think we're getting away from its use a little bit. And we'll talk about maybe why there's a preference for females over males uh, on the next slide. There is a developed registry um, that, that looks at uh, exposures and risk of malignancies over time. You can see over 5,000 patients, there were uh, you know, 15 malignancies noted in a nine-year follow-up period. And thiopurines are also a, a challenging medication to use in the older population. I, I don't like to necessarily put that arrow up on the, the red part of the stoplight because we do use this medication for patients who are older. And instead of saying that it's a concern or a, a significant safety risk, we just need to be cautious with it. When I was starting treating this disease, this is all we really had, steroids and mesalamines and thiopurines. So there's a, a, a plethora of experience in using this medication across the spectrum of, of ages. But what we have to be careful with is that in the elderly population, if you use it for a prolonged period of time, so more than a year, there's a slight increased risk of developing lymphomas, especially if you mix it with biologic therapies similar to the younger population, non-melanoma skin cancers, but that's typically after a prolonged exposure as opposed to just a short time exposure. Uh, there's other cancers that are associated with this potentially, such as urinary tract cancers, but then if you're on this for an extended period of time and require higher doses, infections tend to be the more common complicating factor in the older type patients, and it's mainly shingles. But now we have vaccinations that are very effective against shingles that all of our patients should be getting by at least age 50, and so we can prevent uh, that complication in the majority of our patients. So we need to be careful with this medication. I don't say we should avoid it. It's very effective if we're using it in combination with biologics, especially the anti-TNFs, and you can sometimes get away with using that temporarily as a combination effect rather than prolonged. 
methotrexate is the alternative immunomodulator, and we've been using this in the older population for much longer because of rheumatoid arthritis. So it's a very common medication, commonly used medication in rheumatoid arthritis, and we use it less frequently in the adult population for inflammatory bowel disease. So as you can see at the very bottom there, 2% versus 16% uh, compared to the thiopurines. There's less, better safety data with methotrexate in the older patient population, so the stoplight gets a yellow on this, but there are risk factors that we have to be aware of with methotrexate, namely just side effects of the administration that are related to tolerability, so the nausea can develop in some patients, fatigue, oral ulcerations, changes in your white blood cells, your red blood cells. So you have to be careful with this medication as you choose different dosages because the side effects are typically dose dependent, sometimes can be avoided with folic acid supplementation. But the good thing is that there are no known cancer side effects of this in the short term or long term. So we've used methotrexate in children for a long time as well. Um, it, it's usually dosed once a week, either orally or by a under the skin injection. Uh, some data in kids show that there is um, some adverse events, mostly their gastrointestinal nausea, vomiting, and uh, as Steve mentioned, we use daily folic acid supplementation. Again, in kids, we're not worried about malignancy with the use of methotrexate. Um, we're seeing some increased use of methotrexate as we've gone away from the thiopurines a bit, and we've got some big studies in pediatrics that are ongoing uh, about the use of methotrexate, including with the use of biologics. The last thing I want to mention about methotrexate is we have to be very careful in young women. Uh, methotrexate is teratogenic, meaning uh, it puts young women who are pregnant at risk of birth defects. And so we're very, very careful when women become of childbearing age about the use of methotrexate, either you know, taking away the medication or being very uh, strict in counseling about the use of contraception. The next class of medications are the biologics, and this is becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger class of medications over time, but these are proteins, large molecules that are block uh, mediators of inflammation, and we use these typically in moderate to severe inflammatory bowel disease. Typically, they're administered by either IV or by injections. Um, and, and these are some of the medications that I talked about at the beginning about trying to prevent complications of disease in, in children. You've heard of many of these medications, so infliximab, which is Remicade, and now the biosimilars, adalimumab, which is Humira, and its biosimilars. Now we have different classes of biologics, so we have some of the anti-integrant agents, which is vetalizumab or Antivio, uh, agents that act against interleukins, 12-23 is ustekinumab or Stellara, and, and IL-23, which is risen Rizankizumab, which is Skyrizi, so it just came on the market fairly recently. So multiple classes of medications. Uh, they're very effective, um, and, and they work well. And so in children, we have FDA approval for the use of both uh, infliximab, which is Remicade, and adalimumab, which is Humira, for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis under the age of 18. And in fact, um, in large registries, we don't see significantly increased risk of malignancies with its use. And so these are common, used as an induction agent for moderate to severe Crohn's disease or moderate to severe ulcerative colitis in children, and they're highly effective. Um, the other agents are not approved by the FDA for use in kids under 18, and so we call these investigational still, although we have more and more use of these agents, um, and you'll see that there is actually some published uh, case studies uh, series about the use of these other medications in kids. And again, they appear to be effective, but we're using them off-label without FDA approval. And, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of these medications uh, mentioned or you've read or come across them reading on the internet, but they're very effective at controlling disease, as Steve mentions. And if you notice a common theme that I've been talking about in the older adult population, infection seems to crop up quite a bit, infections on thiopurines, maybe infections on methotrexate, infections on steroids. Well, infections still hold true for anti-TNFs, 
just need to be cautious with them. We don't need to avoid them because they do prevent the use of corticosteroids, which also cause complications in the adult and the older adult population. So there's a threefold increased risk of adverse events if you're over the age of 65 when you use anti-TNFs. Namely, that comes in the form of infections, but it can also come in the form of uh, neurologic injury in rare patients and also congestive heart failure exacerbation in some patients with more advanced heart failure. So you just have to be careful in using this medication. So I want to give it a green light here, despite the risks of uh, anti-TNFs. And I think sometimes it's the fear of the medication from both the prescriber, my perspective, I don't want to injure a patient that I'm going to start this medication on, and also the patient who's going to be taking this medication when they read about these risks. And that prevents us from sometimes treating the disease optimally. And so the disease will continue and smolder in patients who are over the age of 60, and then that's how they end up uh, requiring hospitalization or developing flares or complications of disease or even surgery. So we just have to use it cautiously, but we should still use it. But we also have the luxury of using alternative biologics like vitalizumab or ustekinumab, Nativio and Stellara. And these are considered safer medications. So vitalizumab, if it's a targeted uh, biologic that suppresses the inflammation in the gut. Although it's targeted, you would assume that the risk of infection with this is uh, much lower. But interestingly, the risk of infection in the older population is the same as the younger population, slightly increased over placebo. So why does that happen? We don't understand. But the infections that do happen on vitalizumab are not serious. So I think we should not avoid using this medication because of our fear of infections. Ustekinumab, which is not well studied in the older population, the patients greater than 60 years old, uh, but the limited data we do have, especially in psoriasis, does not show a safety signal in the uh, small real world population. The studies that we have show that the efficacy is similar to vitalizumab and the infection risks are lower. This infizumab, the newer uh, biologic, we don't have much data yet on the very or the elderly uh, onset IBD. So time will tell with this one, but vitalizumab and ustekinumab will probably be your preferred treatment uh, selection and biologics in patients over the age of 60. Now, the category of treatment, small molecules. It's very exciting that this is now coming to the forefront and being available for our patients. It's in ulcerative colitis only for now. Maybe in the future it'll be available for Crohn's disease. But these are oral medications, so that's nice compared to the injection and the infusions of the biologic we were just talking about. And these also have a broader immunosuppressive effect for patients, similar to the immunomodulators, and they dampen the immune response uh, across the board. The two types that are now available for patients are uh, Janus kinase inhibitors, or what we call JAK inhibitors. These are um, medications that suppress multiple cytokines involved in inflammation that's pertinent or relevant to inflammatory bowel disease. This is a second-line therapy, so to, in order to prescribe this, one has to fail an anti-TNF biologic. There's two of them that are on the market now. One of them uh, is Zelgens or Tofacitinib. This is a less selective JAK inhibitor. I don't want to get into the details of the biology, but there's multiple JAKs involved in inflammation. And the more selective you are towards JAK1, the more likely you are to target the inflammation that you're seeking to suppress without creating the side effects out there by inhibiting the other JAKs. So the new uh, JAK inhibitor, Rinvoker Rotatacitinib, selectively inhibits JAK1. It tries to reduce the amount of side effects and also improve the amount of inflammation control. The other small molecule out there now is Ozanamod or Zaposia. This is something called a sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor modulator. It's a new class of medication, and the way you should think about it is that it prevents uh, the, a particular type of an immune cell called a lymphocyte in the body from leaving your lymph node and entering the organ that it's trying to go damage, so in this case, colon. It's... We'll, we'll get into the safety on the next slide. It's considered a, a uh, safe medication because it's of its particular effect. 
whereas the Janus kinase inhibitors may carry a variety of side effects that I'll get into on my next slide. So this is mainly used in the adult population and limited data are available for the older population. But JAK inhibitors carry a black box warning for our patients who are older, mainly in the form of cardiovascular disease risk, thrombosis or blood clot risks, and infection risks. So that's why this is uh, only available for patients who have failed other therapies such as anti-TNF therapies. Recent study examining patients over the age of 50 who have rheumatoid arthritis and have more than one cardiovascular disease risk factor showed that there was an increased risk of developing these complications, and that's why this medication has received a black box warning. But it is highly effective at controlling inflammation. Bupatacitinib probably a little bit more efficacious than tofacitinib in controlling the inflammation in ulcerative colitis. We have to be careful with the risk of infections, mainly shingles. So our patient seems to be vaccinated for shingles before or should be vaccinated for shingles before starting this medication. And because of the risk for infection and this black box warning, that's why it gets a red stoplight here for uh, patients who are over the age of 60. But again, our data in inflammatory bowel disease, or in this case, ulcerative colitis, is limited in the patients who are older than the age of 60, and we extrapolate that information mainly from the patients who are using this for rheumatoid arthritis. Oxanamod or Symposia, the other small molecule, also has limited data in inflammatory bowel disease in patients who are over the age of 60. A lot of this information is extrapolated for, from patients who have multiple sclerosis, which is the other indication for this medication. But the safety profile for this medicine is, uh, seems a little bit better than the JAK inhibitors. The main risk is those with cardiac problems. Well, of course, if you're over the age of 60, you're more likely to have a cardiac disease, so you have to be cautious with it. But the main risk is maybe dropping your heart rate a little bit, something called bradycardia, where your heart beats a little bit slower on it. So you just have to monitor that closely to make sure that that doesn't get into a dangerous range. That's a rare side effect of this. So I think in general, this would be considered a safer medication to use compared to the JAK inhibitor in the older patient population. And if I could put a second arrow for small molecules, I would probably put it in the yellow area as opposed to the red area for the JAK inhibitor. So I would put two arrows on this for the two different small molecules. But it is nice in that it is a pill as opposed to an injection or an infusion. Just very briefly, the JAK inhibitors and S1P modulators are not FDA approved under the use or for the use of 18 and younger, under the 18 years. So we have very minimal experience with the use of these drugs. Uh, there's sporadic case reports that are starting to pop up, but really um, we don't have much data about their efficacy or safety under the age of 18. We're almost to the end. Uh, we just wanted to touch base quickly on dietary therapy. I know this is an area of interest for many of you, and the next talk is going to talk a little bit about diet. There's a variety of diets that have been studied and used in inflammatory bowel disease, more commonly Crohn's disease. There's a couple different what I call restriction diets. One is the specific carbohydrate diet, or SCD. There's also the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. Uh, there's also something called exclusive enteral nutrition, which is used to put patients into remission and induction therapy, actually, where uh, you take formula alone for 8 to 12 weeks as your sole source of nutrition, and that actually has a high rate of putting um, uh, kids into remission. Um, there are some limitations to dietary therapy. They're probably not as effective if you have severe disease or if you have disease complications like penetrating or fistulizing disease, then diet therapy is probably not appropriate. And the last thing to think about is we can often use dietary therapy in conjunction with medications. You don't have to use one or the other. Sometimes they can work effectively together. And, and dietary therapy in kids gets a green light. There's really not much risk of diet therapy. It, it can be difficult, obviously, to put a growing child on a restriction diet or to ask them to take formula only. And some kids, if they choose this, may need a temporary feeding tube through their nose down to the stomach. It's important that we have the expert help of a dietitian familiar with these diets and with inflammatory bowel disease to help counsel the patients. Obviously, we want to monitor their weight and growth very carefully while they're on a restriction diet or an uh, enteral nutrition-based diet. And, and I think diet is important. I don't want to get into the details of it too much because there's a talk coming up on that next. 
unfortunately, it's less studied in the adult population and even less studied in the elderly population compared to the pediatric population. But changes in your diet does make you feel better. And in the, in the end, you want to feel better, right? You want to suppress inflammation, you want to heal inflammation, but you want to get through the day and you want to feel better. So if that makes, uh, if diet helps with that, it needs to be an important regimen in our treatment. And sometimes it's just not included in our treatment or we don't have the time in clinics to do that. So I think it's important to study. There is some data in the adult population that compared the specific carbohydrate diet to the Mediterranean diet. They were very similar in improving symptoms. So almost half the patients in the study improved their symptoms with as soon as six weeks on this diet. So in my clinic, if patients are asking specifically on what diet helps, I tell them the Mediterranean diet is a good healthy diet to choose uh, because there's benefits in other disease states with the Mediterranean diet as well. And, and I think that more research needs to be done in patients over the age of 60 on how diet can help in inflammatory bowel disease. That's just not really available at this time. So do we need more specific studies in the pediatric population? I hope you can tell from what I've presented to you that the answer is, of course, yes. We need more evidence about pharmacokinetics or how children metabolize these medicines. We need uh, comparable study designs where we can compare different medications and synchronous studies, meaning at the same time. We have to be careful about looking about specific pediatric outcomes, including growth and puberty and development corticosteroid sparing medications, and obviously when we look at safety in kids, we have to look at things that also can affect growth and development, the risk of malignancies and the risk of other long-term side effects. And it's important that, uh, as Steve mentioned, we need to think about quality of life and patient-reported outcomes like pain, uh, discomfort, fatigue. Those are important outcomes that we need to focus on. Safety trials in children should never be omitted. Equally as important in the older population, especially for those patients who are over the age of 60, there's a lot of gaps in data and information and research in this demographic. Why is this important? Well, one third of the IBD patients in 2030 are, are going to be over the age of 60. So that number is going to continue to increase, and we need more information there. So we definitely need more uh, population-specific studies in elderly patients. We need to include patients over the age of 60 more robustly in clinical trials so that we can understand safety in this population and efficacy. And also have to remember that we shouldn't be fearful of treating patients over the age of 60 because of the risk. We should be cautious in treating treat people over the age of 60 because if you don't, you're going to end up with similar rates of hospitalization and even surgery in patients who might not develop those same complications of disease as we looked at in those early slides. We also don't know yet which specific risk factors patient, we need to monitor for patients that would put them at risk for adverse outcomes. Is it the amount of comorbidities or other medical diagnoses they may have? Or is it something, rather than age, we should look at frailty, how functional somebody is that would put them at risk for adverse outcomes. So we shouldn't lump everybody into, uh, oh, you're over the age of 60, we, we have to limit the amount of treatment you're, you're going to receive because of fearful of the risks or fearful of infection. Infections are, are definitely important, but I think we need more research in that particular area. And we also have to investigate what happens when you're taking nine medications. So studies showed that patients over the age of 65 who had inflammatory bowel disease, the majority of them averaged nine other medications as well. So if you're mixing these IBD therapies with nine other medications, what's the implication of that? I think we have two more slides and we'll be done. Um, just briefly on vaccinations, we, we separate vaccinations into what we call non-live or killed vaccines, which is at the bottom, uh, versus the attenuated or live vaccines at the top. And the summary of this slide is, for all those killed or non-live vaccines, they're safe to use, including when patients are taking any of these medications that we've talked about. So very important, we recommend, obviously, annual flu shots. Uh, the COVID vaccines are safe to use. The other regular pediatric vaccinations are certainly safe to use when patients are taking these medicines. If a patient needs to go on an immune modulator or a biologic, then there are some guidelines about timing of doing vaccines, and, and you and your provider can talk about that specifically. Just one more before we're going to be 
cautious in infections in the older population, this is one way to be effective and, and cautious, is vaccinate the patient before you start a treatment that may put them at risk, such as surgery. So some take-home messages for both pediatric and elderly patients. Uh, we ensure that the diagnosis is correct. We all want to limit steroids as much as possible. Appropriately vaccinate these patients to keep them safe. In pediatrics, we want to limit thiopurine use, especially in boys. Methotrexate may be a better option, but we have to be careful in young women. And treat effectively. Um, as, I'm, as you saw at the beginning, this disease is progressive. Uh, an early age of onset is a risk factor for more complex disease, and we want to prevent that. And we prevent that by getting disease under control quickly and monitoring for any flares of disease. I think the take-home point for patients over the age of 60 is we should be cautious in using immunomodulators and anti-TNFs. We should not necessarily avoid them, but if we are going to use immunotherapies, there are alternative immunotherapies we can use as monotherapy without uh, thiopurine or methotrexate along with it. So we can consider vedolizumab or ristatinumab as maybe first-line biologics in patients over the age of 60 that may have equal efficacy and reduced infection risk. We need to be careful of drug-drug interactions that we're not even familiar with, especially as we're using the new small molecules um, that are taken orally and can mix with other oral medications. And then we also have to examine our patients and their uh, functional status. How sick are they? How functional are they? And then determine their risks of uh, treatment outcomes using that. And remember, you're only as old as you feel. We thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. Uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, you know, we started 10 minutes late, and we had to come.